Buonasera a tutti, welcome. Good welcome, evening, thank you. everyone. Buonasera. Buonasera, Rita. Buonasera, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Buonasera, Jill. Hi, Jill. Buonasera, Steve e John. Hi. Buonasera. 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 Buonasera Carla, buonasera Dolly e John, buonasera Margaret, ciao. Buonasera. Buonasera Anna, Kristen. Ok, guys, in the meantime, uh, please, um, I kindly ask to mute yourself um, so we can avoid uh, the crown noises and echo like we're here now and okay and maybe 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 we can start i think I, that some people will connect in the few in few minutes but i think we can start uh just a um, a short introduction. Uh, most of you uh, know me and uh, Tony, <laughs> but uh, however, um, I am Isabella Carrino and I'm the owner and managing partner of Italian Experiences. Um, the Italian Experiences is a company that promotes Italian culture and traditions in the US uh, and we organize different kinds of events. Uh, like this one, cooking class and uh, Italian language classes and much more. Um, so today we are here because it's the second episode of Destination Italy and with Tony, Tony Cacace, uh, who, is the, who is a tour guide and advisor at Luxrolink. Um, we'll talk about tonight about accommodations and transportations. So in the first epi episode, we talked about destination, but of course, as soon as we decide where to go, we need to decide how to stay, uh, how to move around <laughs> uh, and visit places. So um, Tony uh, will guide you uh, in this topic. Um, of course, as usual, uh, if you have questions, you can use the chat box uh, and write your, your question there, or uh, you can unmute yourself and ask directly to Tony uh, your questions. Uh, so, so far so good, Tony, <laughs> we can start. Okay, well, thank you to Isabella and uh, Italian Experiences uh, for uh, allowing me to share Italy and I'm glad to see many familiar faces also from uh, last week and some more. So thank you for joining us for this um, second episode of uh, Destination Italy, where we want to give an overview and some tips on um, uh, planning your future trip to Italy. So as Isabella said, the uh, last Time, the first episode, we just talked a little bit about the popular and the off the beaten track uh, uh, cities or destinations. And today we're going to talk instead about accommodations and transportations, which uh, can be quite different from what you would expect when you're traveling uh, through the modern world or the US. Uh, in fact, uh, when you are traveling to Europe or to Italy, uh, there is some truth behind uh, the fact that they call it the old world, the ancient world. <laughs> the uh, structures there are already, uh, in, on average, older than the structures that you find in the US. And um, a lot of times you have... Um, areas of the cities that you're visiting uh, that are protected by UNESCO uh, because, for example, Italy is the country with the most uh, world heritage sites. Those are UNESCO sites. And therefore, when you're visiting um, the city center of Rome or Florence, Venice, the Amalfi Coast, 
there are limitations to the kind of um, structures that you can build there or even renovate. And therefore, you're not going to find the same standardized uh, expectation that you have when you're traveling around the US with all the different franchise hotels. Uh, in fact, you're not going to find a Marriott, a Hyatt, a Holiday Inn Express, a Hilton, a Crown Plaza in every single city or many of them in a city. Uh, they are quite rare. And most of them would happen to be more in the outskirts of a city uh, because that's where they can actually build a bigger size hotel with bigger rooms, uh, with the quality and standards that their clients normally expect to have from those brands. While when you're visiting uh, the city centers, the downtown, you're going to find more family run hotels or smaller chains or unknown chains um, because uh, they are limited in what they, uh, the kind of room that they can offer as far as space and standards of quality. And if you find one of the big chains in the city center, well, most of the times that means you're going to be paying quite a bit for that room. Uh, it, they are quite expensive. Um, but there are different forms of accommodation. Um, some people, uh, many people nowadays, uh, try to uh, rent a, an apartment. So you can use the most popular website is Airbnb nowadays, but there are many other websites. There are operators that um, uh, specialized in renting apartments. Um, you can find a variety of apartments downtown or more in the outskirts or in the countryside. Uh, when I book Airbnb uh, or I help some clients with some suggestions, uh, I tell them not to only look at the pictures. It's very important that you go into the details, that you read some reviews, that you see if the um, host is, um, is rated well because the pictures can be tricky and not always reflect the real experience that uh, you have by uh, booking that apartment. And um, one uh, uh, negative of the Airbnb is that if you're really just staying for one or two nights, uh, it might not be the best option because between cleaning fees and some other fees, then the cost of that apartment ends up being sometimes higher than just booking a hotel room. So it always depends what kind of experience and how long you are um, visiting a place. Um, the hotels normally come from uh, a, in different categories or stars. Um, in the lower category, you have the bed and breakfast or the pensione, which is normally like a little family run uh, hotel uh, or two star hotels. Uh, so this is um, the starting basic point. Uh, actually, it's uh, one step above from the uh, hostels, right, where you have a lot of the younger travelers normally using uh, the hostels. Uh, but they can be uh, already a good starting point. Um, I've tried uh, on one of my trips, I decided I was going to book all bed and breakfast. There are some websites that are specialized in bed and breakfast. Uh, and my personal experience was that 50% of the time it was a great experience. 50% of the time it was not what I expected from all the research and the pictures and the reviews that I uh, read, uh, but it was different. Uh, sometimes it was an apartment uh, run by uh, the owner. Sometimes it was just a room rented out. Uh, other times it was an entire house. So you have to be very careful when you're booking a bed and breakfast uh, or pensione or a two-star hotel. The next level is a three-star hotel. So this is, I would say, one of the minimum categories that I would recommend uh, anyone from the States uh, uh, traveling to Italy to start from. Uh, but it depends what you're looking for. If you want to stay within a certain budget um, and have 
a room to stay, a three-star hotel can work, but expect the room to be pretty much basic. And sometimes you can have a three-star that is still pretty nice. It would probably be close to a four-star. We call them a three-star superior. But other times uh, you can find three-star hotels that have a small room, very small bathroom to the point that uh, the bathroom is a combination of the sink, the shower and the toilet all mixed together. Uh, but you know, you can look at the bright side in the morning, you can maximize your time sitting on the toilet, taking a shower and brushing your teeth all at the same time. So if you are doing a lot of activities, then that can help quite a lot to save time. Um, the breakfast normally at a three-star hotel, um, if it's included, you have to expect a very basic continental breakfast. Um, you can have some croissants, pastries, that's a typical Italian breakfast with a coffee, cappuccino. Normally it would come from a machine or uh, you would have sometimes the croissants in packs. It's standard in Italy to have what we call a merendina, which is these little pastries that come already in packages. Uh, sometimes it could be a nicer breakfast with a little bit more of a buffet style, maybe with some um, uh, fruit or some cereal and so on. If you want instead to have a little bit more of a premium experience, uh, I would say the four-star hotels are the best combination of quality and price. So you can find many nice four-star hotels, either in the downtown or a little bit further out. A lot depends on how you're traveling around with what kind of transportation, because if you have rented a car, you would probably want to have a hotel that is a little bit more outside of the downtown for parking reasons and for limitations to traffic, which we'll talk about later. So you have a parking space, but a Forza hotel already has a little bit nicer room um, have a TV, probably will have air conditioning that works. Um, um, it will have more services and it would have usually a nicer buffet breakfast, uh, often including some eggs and bacon, uh, fresh fruit, cereal, yogurt, some cold cuts and cheeses. So you're already upgrading your uh, experience with a four-star hotel and it might be worth that little extra cost from a three-star hotel. Then you have, of course, we're talking luxury. Uh, there's some nice uh, venues, five stars, uh, resorts, or you could look into renting an entire castle or a villa. Um, Often I would suggest this kind of option of renting a castle or villa if you're traveling with uh, maybe a few families, a group of friends, uh, more couples together, like four or five couples, because at this point, of course, if you rent the entire castle or villa, it, we're talking about several thousand dollars, but you can split that between the different couples and there'll be enough bedrooms for each couple or each friend to have their own uh, uh, bed. So those are different forms of accommodation. Of course, uh, you can find uh, these uh, different accommodations using um, hotel websites, uh, Airbnb, bed and breakfast websites, uh, um, websites like book, booking.com even include a search for apartments and bed and breakfast, or you can just, um, uh, talk to a travel agent and find uh, these properties. And especially if you're looking for the higher end properties, uh, some travel agents are able to get some added benefits to your booking uh, if they're part of a consortium. So that, those are some of the um, options you have to look at in accommodations. Then if you're really lucky, maybe you have friends in Italy or family and you just stay with them. So then uh, you save the money and you have a very local experience. Uh, moving to transportation, uh, obviously there are different ways that you can go around the country, just like here, also in Italy. 
you could call a taxi if you're just visiting uh, one city and you're going from uh, one site to the other. Some people ask me, don't they have Uber or Lyft in Italy? And uh, my answer is technically they don't really have Uber and Lyft, only in a few of the big cities you could find that kind of service. But don't go to Italy re re relying on using your Uber app or your Lyft app. You're going to find a traditional taxi. And when you are taking a taxi in Italy or in Europe, you have to make sure that it is the car marked as a taxi um, because there are also those called NCC, which is a car with a driver, and those can charge very hefty prices. Um, so you have like a chauffeur driven car and they'll offer you a ride and you'll think it's a taxi, but then you'll end up uh, having to pay quite a bit. And this can happen often when you first arrive uh, in the country, like at the airport. It's very important at the airport that you go to the taxi stand outside, the official taxi stand, and you don't accept a ride from just anyone who steps up to you and offers you a taxi ride to your hotel. Those are normally people, uh, cars with driver that are trying to get some business their way. And then uh, you'll enter that car, it won't have a meter and you could be paying much more than expected. So always look for the taxi sign, a taxi stand and the meter inside the taxi. And normally there will be the list of the charges behind the seat that they can apply so that you double check that you know, you're not getting ripped off with a taxi. Um, obviously you could uh, decide to plan your own trip by renting a car. Uh, one very important thing to notice is that the fees for renting a car in uh, Europe and Italy are not the same as the fees that you pay for renting a car in the US. Uh, I have found myself, generally speaking, that uh, the average cost of renting a car in Italy is higher than when you rent a car in the US, uh, sometimes even double the cost. So, and then you have to calculate also the other costs with the rental car, uh, fuel. Uh, fuel, uh, people here are complaining about a $4 a gallon. Uh, well, welcome to Italy. You'll be paying uh, a euro 52 euros per liter, which is in the end when you transform liters to gallon and uh, euro into dollar, you're going to be paying about eight, nine dollars a gallon uh, to drive your car around. Uh, obviously, most of the cars in Italy are uh, better with consumption. We have smaller cars, medium sized cars. Uh, diesel cars. So, you know, you'll get a little bit more mileage from your car. Um, don't expect the cars to be automatic uh, shift. Most of them will be manual shift. You'll pay more for an automatic shift uh, if they have any. And then also you have to be prepared to share the road with the other Italian drivers while you're looking at the signs. Uh, and not always you'll know which direction to go because we don't have signs that show you the direction north, south, east, west. You have to know the geography of the country to know which direction you're going. So the starting city and the city you're heading to, you have to know if that's position north, south, east or west of where you are. So you have to do a little bit of geography study of course, many people say, but I have a GPS, so I'm not gonna worry about that. Well, the GPS is good and it's helpful when you're driving on the motorway, but once you leave the motorway and you are on a countryside road, even the GPS can start getting confused because you might reach an intersection uh, with four or five different options on how to reach your destination. And then that's up to you. Uh, to understand if it's going over a mountain or uh, if it's a more fast route and so on. Uh, also be prepared when you're taking the motorway in Italy that you're going to be paying fees for uh, entering the motorway. So as you enter, you'll collect a ticket at one of these uh, uh, boxes 
and that's the where you enter the motorway and then you'll pay when you exit you have to present that ticket to the machine and it will calculate how much you pay it's very important that you keep that ticket i had one um, uh, guest who lost their ticket and so then when you reach the exit uh, you'll have to go to the help point uh, or they will just take a picture if there's nobody there to assist you of your number plate and then you'll have to deal for it took us about a month to deal back and forth with paying this ticket with the fees and penalties and all that so uh, just for entering and exiting the motorway for this uh, couple that should have cost three four euros ended up costing 70 80 euros uh, so you have to be careful with these things you can see also from the picture there is the cash box there is the card box and what you would call maybe the fast track um, if you rent a car maybe they'll offer you the telepass so this way you take the yellow lane or you can buy on a service area uh, a card a prepaid card and just use that uh, sometimes you can use your own credit card uh, but be careful using your credit card in in italy on europe with the foreign transaction fees you might be paying those every time you're paying anything in the country. And if you go to the um, uh, cash, uh, make sure you have small change because not always they'll accept a uh, 100 euro bill for a 1 euro 50 fee on the motorway. So you have to be very careful with all that. Um, obviously it can be fun and adventurous to rent a car uh, and you'll learn a lot. Uh, also, you'll learn some instincts that you didn't maybe know you had, and maybe you'll also learn a few swear words as you get more familiar uh, driving around. <laughs> so, but uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot. Also, how to find parking, and you'll have to learn about limited traffic zones and uh, um, times that you can actually drive through the center without getting a ticket so it's it's quite complicated nowadays um, to drive a car and visit these cities um, i remember i had a couple i was on a trip i left the hotel in rome with my group we went to the restaurant we came back after dinner and this couple was just coming back they left at the same time as us and they were telling the hotel reception can you call a taxi for us and the reception said, what happened? And they said, well, we'll be driving. We've been driving two and a half hours and we were not able to find a parking space. So we decided to come back to the hotel and go back with the taxi. So a lot of time consuming <laughs> in that case. Um, if you are going around a city or a town, you can use the bus, the local bus. This picture is very important because when you're using the local bus, you have to normally buy your ticket before you board the bus. Normally you have to buy it in a tobacco shop, uh, which you find in many different places throughout the town or at a news agent stand. But you can't normally buy the ticket as you board the bus. You have to have that ticket beforehand. So you have to do your homework and get the ticket then when you get on the bus, you have to validate the ticket. It's not enough to have a ticket. It has to actually go in this machine and it prints the date and the time you started your journey. If a control comes by and you don't have a validated ticket, but only a ticket, for them, it's like you have no ticket at all. And I've had some uh, travelers that had some bad experiences where they were facing a uh, fine for having a ticket, but not having validated the ticket. And each city has its own tickets. So you cannot buy a ticket in Rome and then use it in Florence for the local public transportation. You have to buy tickets for each city, for each local transportation. It's the same like here. If you follow the logic, you can't go to Boston, buy local transportation ticket there and then use it in San Francisco, okay? Each city is its own system and the systems can vary. The ticket could be worth one ride on the subway with the bus. It could be worth 
a certain amount of time, like in Rome could be worth 75 minutes, or you could buy a daily ticket. Or like in Venice, you can buy a 24 hour or 36 hour ticket for the ferry system in Venice. So you'll have to um, do a little bit of research on what the rules are for each public transportation system. But remember, the validation is very important. Uh, if you're traveling from city to city, uh, there are a few options. So if you were going from Rome to Orvieto, a nice little medieval village between Rome and Florence, you could not take the fast train option. You would have to take a regional train, which is what you see here. The intercity uh, is a regional train, which would make many stops in between Rome and Florence, for example. And one of those stops would be Orvieto or Siena and so on. Um, so it's very important if you're traveling to smaller villages or smaller cities um, that you take an intercity train and that you check, you know, um, sometimes you have to do a connection, like if you're going um, to Pisa from Florence, sometimes it's a direct train, sometimes you might have to stop and make a connection in Empoli, for example, or if you want to reach the Cinque Terre. So the intercity train, regional train is what you would do to reach the smaller towns. But if you're just connecting from one big city to another, let's say from Rome to Venice or from Florence to Milan, then you can take the fast train, uh, the Freccia Rossa, uh, so the Freccia trains, which means arrows, or the Italo. Uh, these trains reach a maximum speed of 300 kilometers per hour. So you can pretty much reach from Rome to Florence in an hour and a half compared to three, three hours or three and a half hours driving. So that can be very convenient. You can buy the ticket the same day or in a peak period, I would suggest to buy it some days before. You can buy it online or you can buy it at the station uh, beforehand from the machines or from the uh, ticket desk. Uh, so if you're traveling from big city to big city, so Naples to Rome to Bologna, Florence, Venice, Milan, without any intermediate stop, then you take the fast train because it doesn't really make those little intermediate stops. And that's uh, something fun to do to enjoy the fast speed. Another difference between the regional train and the uh, fast speed is that on a fast speed train, when you buy a ticket, you have already a reserved seat. So you're not allowed to go on these fast trains and just stand. Uh, you have to have a reserved seat. Well, the intercity, you can buy it without a reservation of a seat. If you're lucky, you find a seat. Otherwise, you just stand. Or you can pay extra to reserve a seat on the intercity. So that's traveling by train. Now, you could take some day trips or you could be traveling around the country with an operator that specializes in small groups. So if you're doing a daily trip or maybe visiting the wine country and you book a day trip with a small group, it could be a small van with six to eight people or a mini bus with 16 to 30 people. Normally those can reach uh, average of 24, 28 in a group. Um, but those are ways that you could travel around the country or just do a day trip using uh, um, a local operator or a small group travel operator. Uh, one of the standard ways of traveling around Italy and you'll see quite often are these bigger buses. So these are group tours Normally they would have an average of anywhere between 30 and 48 passengers. Um, so in this case, you would have an entire itinerary that is already being pre-planned. It would take you to different destinations. You don't have to worry about driving and the directions, about the motorway tolls and um, about all the other things like parking in the city. The bus will 
drop you off where your group is going to visit a site with your guide and then pick you up later. And then it will be your driver who has to worry about where he's parking that big bus while he's waiting for your sightseeing. So there's a lot of operators that offer these uh, group tours. If you don't like the idea of traveling in a group with uh, 40, 45, 48, or maybe even 50 people, there are operators that would um, uh, limit their groups to a smaller size, normally uh, up to 24 or 28 people. So um, you can choose maybe that option. Then uh, another way of traveling around Italy, Italy has two islands, two big islands and many smaller islands. So another way is to use the ferry. Uh, you can go from um, the toe of Italy um, in Calabria and cross over to Sicily with uh, a ferry that can load trucks and cars. Even the train can get loaded on a special ferry and cross over to the rail track in Sicily. Uh, you could take an overnight ferry from Naples to reach Sicily, to reach Palermo or an overnight ferry from Civitavecchia, north of Rome, to go to the other island, Sardinia. Uh, you can take ferries between Sardinia and Corsica. You can take ferries, smaller ferries, to the islands of Capri, Ischia, the Aeolian Islands, Elba Islands, so lots of islands. You could even take ferries to cross to other countries uh, across the Adriatic, like going to Croatia, or going to Greece. So from Bari or Brindisi, you could go over to Greece, or from Bari and Kona, you could go to Croatia. And so if it's a longer uh, ferry ride, normally these ferries could accommodate also carrying, as I said, vehicles, a car, a truck, and so on. If it's just the smaller islands like Capri, Isola d'Elba, or the Aeolian Islands normally would be a smaller ferry just for passengers. So um, the ferries also you can book ahead of time, especially the overnights. Um, otherwise, normally you'll buy the ticket the day of, of your trip, if it's a smaller ferry to just do a day trip to an island. Uh, so after talking about accommodations and uh, transportation, I'm just gonna bring up a few itinerary ideas. And I picked this first itinerary, which is a long itinerary. It's one of the longest ones of Italy. It's 17 days. You don't have to read everywhere it goes. The only reason I picked this is because imagine if you wanted to visit all these cities and you had to do it by driving your own rented car or using transport like a train and ferries everywhere, it can become quite complicated. Um, and I would have to admit that if you're exploring any part in the south, south of Naples, it can become even more complicated uh, with the train system because uh, not all the um, tracks are set up for high speed in the south. Sometimes they still use the slower trains and sometimes they can have problems, like they can stop suddenly. So you have to have always a backup plan if you are using public transport in the South. I would suggest if you wanna do it on your own, you rent a car for the South. Don't rely on the public transportation or you use an operator if you are trying to visit many places in little time. Uh, but that's just to give you an idea. If you want to do a very complicated itinerary, I suggest maybe to look at some operators and what they offer before trying to plan all that on your own. If you want to do something more simple, but you don't want to sit on a bus or you don't want to be driving a car, uh, there are some operators that offer also train trips. So you can visit Rome, Florence, and Venice, three nights in each city and you'll have the local uh, bus, um, the tourist bus that will take you around with a guide and a driver in the cities. But then you'll go from Rome to Venice and from, from Rome to Florence and Florence to Venice using the high-speed train. So that would all be part of 
the package offered by the operator. So there are some train trips that you can look at. Um, again, this is another uh, interesting itinerary, which will go and explore from Rome into the heart of Tuscany, along the Cinque Terre, up to Lake Maggiore and the Lake District, and then up to the Dolomites and the ski area of Cortina d'Ampezzo and end in Venice. Just to give you an idea that to go visit all these places, you have to imagine how many different forms of transportation you would have to be prepared to take with regional trains, ferries, uh, and uh, high-speed trains, if, unless you rent a car. So that is where uh, a, uh, an itinerary like this would come uh, uh, more beneficial to do again with an operator. Uh, there are some operators that offer an immersive experience. Uh, this operator here will, no, actually this is um, a five star. So the next one is the immersive experience. If you're looking for um, a luxury experience, like you'd like to stay in all the five star hotels and you like to have a nice uh, chauffeur and driver with a bus, maybe not too big of a group, maximum 30 people. Uh, one example is this classic Italy. So you will visit Naples, Rome, Central Italy with Orvieto and Assisi, so some off the beaten track uh, towns, San Gimignano, you'll go visit the Cinque Terre, and then Florence, and then you'll use a fast uh, train between Florence and Venice. So it's a nice combination. You have the tour bus, you have the fast train, you have uh, high uh, five star hotels, and you don't have the days that are too intense. So you could look at an itinerary like this. Or as I was saying, there is also another itinerary. I guess it skipped the slide. It's called the Ultimate Italy. And that is a company that uh, focuses on immersive experience. So what it does, it takes you around the country on depending on the itinerary you have chosen. But in every city, you, you, you use a local transportation. So sometimes you'll be just taking the public bus with your guide. Other times you'll take a local train. Another time you'll have your private bus. And other times you'll have a fast train. So G Adventures is the name of this company. And in Italy and in many other countries where they offer itineraries, they have this mix of transportation and it's a more immersive um, experience. <clears throat> they also sometimes use as accommodation a mix. They have boutique hotel or small uh, villas, apartments or a standard hotel. So if you're more adventurous and you want to try a more immersive experience, then that could be a itinerary that I, I would suggest. If instead you are like um, those who recently, <coughs> sorry, are interested in a more active experience and you wanna go biking, there are also companies that are focused on bike trips, just like this one of the Hill of Italy. Sorry, I've been talking too much. <laughs> I need some uh, water. So this would be a biking experience of Italy. For any information, uh, my name is Tony. You have my email and my website. And uh, feel free to reach me with any questions or I can give you suggestions if you wanna rent a car, Airbnb, or if you're looking for a particular package. And I'll pass it back to Isabella. Oh, thank you, Donnie. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask to Tony. Um, any questions? <coughs> Rob, do you have a question? You are, 
You need to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. I don't. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Tony, you showed an itinerary uh, last week that we were interested in. It was, it started and ended in Milan. It went to Modena and you could visit the uh, Ferrari Museum and um, Luca. It really looked interesting to us. We couldn't find an operator that did that. Well, we only looked at two. We looked at Trafalgar and wherever tours. And I know when you presented it, you mentioned that it was sort of a custom thing. Um, but are you aware of anyone who kind of does that particular itinerary that looks so good to us? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, practically all the itineraries that I suggest, I've uh, taken from many di different operators. Uh, so the one that you are talking about was from Globus. Uh, and it focuses on the north. Uh, Trafalgar does have something similar to that, uh, but I try to be fair with all the operators and uh, I try to find also uh, the itineraries that best match the theme of the day. So that give the idea like today of the different level of accommodation and um, the transportation options. So I try at every episode, there will be some different itineraries, but in case you do see an itinerary and you wanna know a bit more about it, feel free to always email me and uh, I can give you more information. Thank you. That, that was great. Tony, do you, can you say something about agriturismo? Yes, agriturismo would practically be like uh, we could consider it a bed and breakfast, but in a countryside residence. Um, an agriturismo would be usually a farm. I've been in a few agriturismo. There's many in Tuscany, in Puglia. Uh, sometimes they would even offer you the um, experience, sorry, <coughs> the experience of um, making the wine with them or picking the grapes. Uh, depends if you go at the right time, uh, like September, October, uh, picking the olives. Uh, so it can be a, quite an interesting experience. Sometimes it's just uh, countryside uh, farms and they rent some rooms. So maybe they have five, six rooms uh, that they rent out. So there's a lot of variety. As I said, um, it's really difficult to explain accommodation in Italy as a standardized idea. Uh, there's a lot of very particular options and agriturismo is one of the, those. Is there a particular company that helps you get connected to agriturismo places? Um, I don't know of any particular uh, company that just focuses on agriturismo or any website, but there are for sure, operators that uh, rent out apartments uh, that are focused on renting out apartments and villas, and they would have for sure agriturismo venues in their portfolio of properties. Thank you. Okay. Tony, there is a question, uh, question. from, oh, sorry, there is a, uh, I read a question from Carla. She's asking is for a group of 10, could we rent a van and a driver for the whole trip? A group of 10 people. Yes, um, I definitely would say that uh, you can rent a van. I don't know if uh, your license will allow you to drive a van that can sit more than seven or eight <clears throat> people because then you start getting into a vehicle of a bigger size for what you're allowed to drive with your standard license. Um, but up to seven, eight, Yes. Um, they can rent a van with a driver, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, at, with 10, you need a, a, the minimum size would be a minibus, a minibus of uh, 16 seats because, um, <laughs> or maybe there's a 12, 13 seats longer van with a driver. Yeah, you would need a driver for that. Um, the only thing when you're renting a car with a group of people or a van, uh, or even a van with the driver, um, always remember that you kind of have to all agree where you're going because um, uh, 
you can't really just uh, uh, decide that four people go in one place and another four go to the other. So that's uh, something to consider when you're organizing something with a larger group of people as you know your own private itinerary. Maybe two cars are better. Yeah, yeah. Or two vans. Uh, so it depends. Depends what the final goal is. Uh, my my question for anyone who was doing that is, what is your final goal? And uh, if everyone has the same goal, then that's okay. Oh, Steve, go. Yeah, Tony, question. Um, on the Frecha Rosa, we found the second class to be very, very good. When we were traveling in other countries, like in Paris, taking some of the uh, airport trains, we had problems with pickpockets. Is there any problems with pickpockets on any second class trains in Italy? So when you're taking the Freccia Rossa uh, or the Italo, which are the fast trains, normally everyone has a reserved seat. As I said, you are not allowed to stand. So pickpockets on those trains are very rare uh, because normally you have to have a ticket with a seat and stay on the train. Um, you just have to be careful uh, at stops in between, like when people are getting on and off with your luggage, uh, maybe in the luggage compartment. Um, but the, you have to be careful with pickpockets if you are on the regional trains. Mm. Or I know in particular, if you're doing the Cinque Terre with the train, it can get very crowded at times. And in those cases, you can have little groups of gypsies that hide in the bathroom and then just before the train leaves maybe uh, do a little pickpocket and get off the train so whenever it's crowded and you are on a regional local train or on the bus or on the subway anytime and that you're in a situation like that you have to keep your eyes more open not that it happens all the time but, you know, as a tourist, you're coming after a, a long day and you're kind of tired, it's crowded, it's hot, and you can fall victim of a situation like that. But that can happen all around Europe and even in here in the United States. So just in those particular situations, you still need to stay alert. Thank you. Mm, any other questions? No? Okay, I think we are good. So uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the next episode, it will be really fun because we are talking, we will be talking about food experiences, which is the best part for me <laughs> of Italy. <laughs> no, I'm joking, <laughs> but one of the best parts in order to enjoy everything. Uh, food is really important. So we will talk about all the regional, regional foods that you can find and how to experience all this food. Um, so for who donated for today, thank you so much for supporting us. We will, you will receive the e-booklet and the recording for tonight. And for the other one, see you next week. Okay, thank you so much again. Bye, I want guys. to thank, uh, thank, thank Isabella thank and everyone for joining. You have the episodes for next week, my information, and thanks again to uh, Italian Experiences. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Bye.